Perfect. Good. Let's, um, let's kick off. Thank you very much for uh, coming uh, today to the annual lecture for the Centre for Clinical Epidemiology and Evaluation. So I wanted to start off by acknowledging that the land on which we gather is the traditional, ancestral and unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh people. We acknowledge the relationship Vancouver has with our hosts. So welcome to the annual lecture. Um, uh, as you will be very well aware, uh, we have Stephen Lewis uh, giving the lecture today. Delighted that Stephen is with us and we had a very, very productive session with trainees and students earlier where Stephen was uh, sharing his uh, thoughts and words of wisdom on taking their careers forward. So thank you very much for doing that for us, uh, Stephen. Um, with today's events, we're going to have um, a few words of introduction and welcome from uh, Dr. Rob McMaster, who's the uh, uh, director of the Research Institute, uh, the Vancouver Coastal Health Research Institute. Uh, we'll have the lecture, which will be for about an hour, and then we'll have a question and answer session. So if you have comments or questions, then please uh, feel free to make a note of them, and we'll have, uh, try, try and have plenty of time for uh, questions and, uh, and even perhaps answers, uh, if, uh, if, uh, if we're lucky. Um, and then we have a reception afterwards. So as usual with uh, our annual lecture, we'll have a reception that'll just be outside the door. So please don't rush off. Uh, feel free to stop. We've got some food uh, and some, uh, some drink uh, for you afterwards. So just as a reminder, this is our sixth annual lecture. Um, so we've had a number of uh, distinguished uh, people coming before Stephen. Uh, not as distinguished as Stephen, but... Uh, but um, nevertheless, uh, some, some notable names. And uh, all of the, uh, the lectures are available on our YouTube channel. So uh, if you go to C2E2 VCHRI as the YouTube channel, you can, uh, you can view the, uh, the lectures. Um, I've uh, become a convert to Twitter, so I'm going to encourage you. Uh, it's not mandatory, but I, I'm going to be disappointed if I'm still the only person who's used the hashtag C2E2 lecture today. Um, so please feel free to tweet uh, during the lecture, and uh, we'll try and keep a track of some of the Twitter conversation that's happening. So the lecture is on behavioral economics, um, and we really couldn't have timed this better, uh, given, of course, that uh, uh, just this week uh, was the announcement of the Nobel Prize in economics to Dr. Richard Thaler, who is, of course, one of the fathers of behavioral economics. So, uh, so the timing is perfect, and uh, uh, we welcome uh, uh, the thoughts that Stephen has to share with us. So before we move to, to Stephen, I'll ask uh, Rob McMaster to come and make a few opening remarks. So I'll just get the slides up. Thank you, Sterling. And I'd just like to say that we really view these annual lectures from C2E2 as really one of the key lectures at the Vancouver Coastal Health Research Institute. I think it's a terrific audience that each year we bring, and today is even, I think, even larger than some of them in the past. So I think it's a really important, they're always important fields because it really covers much of the area of research and really how do you implement that research and the economics behind it. So we're really pleased to have Stephen Lewis today. And I must confess that I only heard of behavioral economics last week. <laughs> economics, for sure. Health and all economics. We have many economics. I didn't, of the behavioral, I think it was nudging economics. Is that the term that I saw? It was actually new to me. So it would be really interesting to see how that's applied into health. So really welcome, Stephen. And I'm glad he's here both today and advertised for tomorrow morning. Is that still on at 9.30, if I remember right? At 8.30, same place? In, in, at C2E2 for, for, for an additional interaction with Stephen. So today's lecture will be on abandoning illusions, confronting biases. So this will be my first real taste of behavioral economics. Thank you, Steve. Well, thank you very much. And uh, it's a real honor and privilege to uh, be able to give this talk today. Um, obviously, they're descending in order. I, they may have to abandon the series after one or two more since you're scraping already. <laughs> um, and this is... Uh, I'll tell you why I wrote this, did this talk. Um, 
I'm interested in uh, health care improvement. And the older I get, I think I've had to abandon many illusions. And I think I have committed pretty much all of the sins I'm going to attribute to uh, standard ways of thinking about how the world changes and how healthcare improves. So my first uh, disclaimer, if I can advance this, I'll try that. There we go. So um, I should do my disclosure and as in disclaimers. I don't have any financial conflicts of interest, at least here. <laughs> Um, I'm not giving you religion here. Uh, I'm giving you, I hope, some stimulating ideas about how to think about healthcare and change. Uh, and I have no credentials to give this talk. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, I think in some distant way that may be an advantage since uh, I'm not invested in uh, any particular disciplinary approach. And finally, I, this is humble bragging, I actually did write this talk before Thaler won the Nobel Prize in economics. <laughs> so there we go. So here is what I hope to accomplish, um, which is basically, um, the, if a fundamental question is, why is there way more usable evidence than used evidence? The gap between what we know and what we do, what's solid and implementable and what's actually implemented um, I want to then draw these connections. Uh, this is, the thesis is, this is considerably in our own minds and how we are wired to think. Uh, this is not about structures, it is not about health policy writ large, but, so I'm about to argue, the reason why we don't have a healthcare system as good as it could be and as evidence informed as it could be is because of how our minds work, and I think that's the great contribution to, of behavioral economics. So I'm going to do a little clarification, uh, since I suspect uh, a number of people are, are reasonably new to this term and these concepts. And I hope that it, my greatest aspiration for today is that when you go away from this, that you start your own conversations about whether this is meaningful and how it might inform your own work, regardless of which part of the system you may work in. So um, this, this is the part where um, uh, Sterling may uh, regret inviting me, but I'm, I'm going to give you a very short history of economic theory from the beginning to later. <laughs> so the standard economic theories that were fundamentally self-interested, and that's really what defines us, uh, that we therefore are essentially, as, as the economists would call it, utility maximizers. We figure out what's best for us, what gives us, in Jeremy Bentham's famous terms, more pleasure than pain. He was the original uh, formal uh, uh, philosopher of utilitarianism. But basically, we want to get the most materially, economically. Not only that, but we're pretty good calculators, and so we make rational choices among various alternatives. And therefore, by and large, uh, with some noise that even the classical economists would admit, we're, we're basically rational and we're basically logical. And if we're not, it's just kind of noise in the equations or incomplete information. That is, we're almost there, we're getting there, we will continue to get there if only we stay the econometric course. And uh, that ultimately it will be proven true that once we, once we are at get rid of the noise and get rid of the uncertainty that the economists' understanding of human nature and what we aspire to do will be increasingly validated. So, this sounds like evidence-based healthcare. It's very rational. So how, how did, how's it done? Well, um, we know this to be true, that clinical practice guidelines and care pathways, literally in the thousands, are largely ignored. We know that there are enormous variations in practice, especially in utilization rates. I was involved in a study in Saskatchewan no, eight or nine years ago where we looked at uh, surgical vari rates of uh, 29 surgeries and the variations in utilization rates, age sex adjusted by where people lived. In other words, the region where they lived, not where they had the surgery, since most of that is centralized. And, of the 29, 15 of them had a, a, a ratio of at least two and a half to one, highest to lowest, and often three 
and sometimes as high as seven or eight. There are, oddly enough, um, seven times as many nose jobs in Saskatoon as Regina. So, obviously, I've not had one, but uh, there seems to be either a phenomenal outburst of vanity in Saskatoon or some supply-driven activity uh, going on. Uh, so these variations are all over the place, and any quality expert will tell you that a, an unjustified or inexplicable variation is the first sign of a quality problem. Uh, oddly enough, uh, just as I was crunching these numbers and looking at this and sort of feeling increasingly horrified as a prospective patient, I thought, well, they're all different, these 29, but what if we added them all up together? And when we added them all up together, the age sex adjusted rates for 29 surgical procedures aggregated by region, there's no variation. So in Saskatchewan, you're equally likely to be cut open anywhere in the province, but for what? You have no idea. <laughs> Which is, it is amusing, but it's also terrifying in a sense. So again, the rational actor view of humans seems to be somewhat defied there. We know this. I, I'm not sure that 17 is right, that the, the, the famous, almost proverbial figure of 17 years to get high-quality evidence into practice norms. It may not be 17, but it's certainly not two. And it's a long time before the world accepts high-quality evidence. And it's not just in the gray areas. I mean, yes, there are gray areas of practice where you could see, well, maybe there are reasonable disputes about what ought to be done and the Long-term outcomes are inconclusive, but hand-washing seems to be fairly well proven as an effective strategy for reducing infection rates and so on. But even there, we can't get it done, uh, rational though it may be. So basically, evidence-based medicine, or as is now more commonly said, evidence-informed uh, practice, it's never really taken off. I mean, it is certainly embedded in the minds of practitioners, and people who look at, after quality and administrators, it's not an unknown concept. But is it the norm? It is the norm in a very small proportion of healthcare organizations in the world. And it is certainly not the norm in Canada. And similarly, uh, even when the clinical community um, has decided that there are seriously uh, excessive rates of use of now 160 procedures and tests and so forth, um, it certainly hasn't taken off either. So the evidence base is there, clinical leadership is there, and yet the healthcare world does not conform to the rational actor model in any meaningful way. So this is what has, this is troublesome. I think it's troublesome to all of us. Uh, so having, you know, to confess some of my sins, I, I led a, a, this is an aspirational title, an applied health research agency for seven years, and we were among those who were in the 90s um, uh, adopted the linear understanding that if we produce made in Saskatchewan clinical practice guidelines in a number of areas, because they were locally made by local clinicians, they would just be accepted by their peers. And Saskatchewan's a small place, so you can get to them all and it's easy to communicate. Well, it was just, it was just adding to CPG pollution. Uh, it, it just didn't work out. Um, we had one guideline that was successful, wildly successful for about three months. It was uh, PSA testing. And utilization rates went down 37% for each of the first two or three months uh, once we released the guideline. And then, as usual, somebody wrote a letter to Ann Landers saying, I saved my husband's life by making him go to a PSA test. And within a year, the rates had rebounded to their normal rates. So it was a sobering experience. So how do we explain these anomalies typically? And I'll just give you a general typology. There are many nuances in this argument. And one is that providers are willfully unenlightened. Uh, I don't think that's true. Um, part of the sentence may be true. I think the willful part is probably the most <laughs> um, uh, uh, powerful. But actually, I don't think that's true. I think you, know, you have to be smart to get into health science uh, education programs. The training programs are pretty rigorous. People are exposed to evidence. People are exposed to critical appraisal of articles and so on. So I don't think that's a very good explanation. And, it, and if it is a good explanation on the part of some, we should not mistake the, uh, the minority for the typical. 
Others, particularly if you're an American economist, would say the market's working. Um, quit judging what the healthcare system looks like. People are, are marching with their feet and their utilization behavior and their consent. So you guys, you health service research nerds and clinical scientists, we call this chaos and waste, but actually it's valued by both providers and users of services. So this is, a, this is the classic tautology of, of a market theorist, which is it always works because it works. So therefore it's working. <laughs> I don't think that's the case here. Um, this is a common one, and you'll hear this often from providers, that patients force those powerless physicians uh, to do irrational things. So you walk into your doctor's office and you literally bludgeon the person into ordering a precautionary MRI. Happens every day. This is, I think, a absolutely disproven. It is occasionally true that somebody will, will come in and demand a test. It is commonly true that when they do so, that some clinicians will actually do it because it gets the person out of the encounter more quickly. But there is research on this that shows that, by and large, most of us do what our clinicians suggest that we do. We are in their care, and moreover, most of us want a trusting relationship with our clinicians. We do not actually want to be second-guessing what they do, and we do not want to override their clinical judgment. So this one, I think, is a common myth, but I think it's false. And this one, of course, providers thoughtfully reject the RCT RCT-level evidence because they have carefully examined the inclusion and exclusion criteria of the studies, compared it against their own carefully compiled uh, self-audit of their practice, and decided that there is sufficient variation that the RCT does not apply to these patients. I'm sure that's the norm. That's the explanation. <laughs> that's the one. I don't think that's true either. It's actually plausible in some cases, but it's not normally the reason. And this is also very commonly thought, that economic incentives work, but we just haven't effectively used them. We haven't, in other words, it's not the fault of, of standard economic theory, it's the fault of how we're applying the theory and the tools. We're just not very good at it, and when we get better at it, we will save the day. Well, that was all fine, we can have that argument, but then along came the psychologists. And uh, although Richard Thaler is an economist, as are four other winners of the Nobel Prize who could call themselves behaviorists, the, the person who won it first is Daniel Kahneman. Has anyone read Thinking Fast and Slow? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, cool. So Kahneman's a psychologist, so it must have grated the economics community no end that a, a psychologist won the Nobel Prize in economics. But voila, so, so he did. Anyway, the psychologists started examining these assumptions. They performed experiments to test these rationalist assumptions. And there is a fascinating and now enormous body of evidence that's severely damaged. I had originally written totally destroyed, but I thought I should tone it down. <laughs> severely damaged the rationalist paradigm. Um, and these are the results. We're not such great calculators. Sometimes, in defiance of standard economic theory, we're total altruists. Sometimes we are predictably irrational, and our decision-making varies and is influenced by how the options are presented to us. And I'll give you some examples to illustrate this. So this is the most famous image in, image in behavioral economics. It's a urinal for those of you who don't habituate men's washrooms. Uh, I'm assuming that's most of the women, at least. So um, this is a urinal, and uh, this is a fly. So what has one got to do with the other? Well, in, uh, I believe it was in, in Holland, but it was somewhere in Europe. Um, there was a problem, and, and for, for, I'm sorry, but this is the male, but the women, it, this is a little squeamish, but in, in male washrooms, if you use a urinal and it hasn't been cleaned for five minutes, you will find an astonishing amount of urine on the floor. There's a lot of it's it's honestly it baffles me too. It's they're not that it's they're not that small, and you don't have to be gifted to actually do it properly. But there is it's a problem, and it's a it, it is amazingly a problem, and it's not just people of my age. It's it's actually it's a problem. So they tried everything, you know, posting signs, etc., and then one. One person had the idea, so how do men think? <laughs> well, 
Men like to shoot things. <laughs> Men like target practice. So they put an image of a fly in the urinal and reduced the amount of slippage by 80%. <laughs> so no fines, no hectoring, you know, no role modeling, no focus groups. <laughs> Stick a target on. And this, if you had to say what's behavioral economics about, this is basically it. I don't mean by saying, if someone asks you, say, it's about a urinal on a fly. <laughs> what you should say is, it's about getting people to do a desirable thing while retaining complete freedom of choice and having no draconian imposition of rules, fines, or anything else. That's what behavioral economics is, and this is its uh, sentinel image. So, just to give you a couple of examples of how this works. So, don't, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands, but think about these, this option. So, you've, you're, you've got an experiment, and you have, you have, you're in a lucky um, situation. You're, you're in a gamble. You have no chance of losing any money. You have a 50-50 chance of winning a thousand bucks or winning zero. So, you flip a head, you win a thousand, you flip a tail, you get zero. Or you can just take 500 bucks. It's kind of a price is right thing or some game show alternative that's often presented. So again, think about what you would do. And then think about this, which as you'll notice is the exact equivalent, only it's losing. So again, you flip a head and you lose zero, you flip a tail, you lose a thousand dollars, or you can just say, I'm not going to flip a coin, I'm just going to give you 500 bucks. So what the answers are in large population samples of this study is most people take the sure win of $500. Most people will gamble on the loss side. You notice this is exact equivalent. So again, in standard economic theory, a $500 loss is exactly the same magnitude as a $500 gain. But it isn't in people's minds. So this confirms the principle of loss aversion. We are more loss averse than we are gain seeking. A loss hurts more than a gain gives us pleasure. And the ratio is about two to one, according to the literature. So keep that in your minds because I'm going to illustrate uh, a little bit later about how that may come into play uh, in, in health. Another interesting finding was the power of irrelevant but plausible information. I'm going to give you two scenarios. So, I'm going to ask you, is the height of the tallest redwood tree more or less than 1,200 feet? Now, just again, think of the figure in your brain I'll that you cogitate. So, I assume you've got your figure. And when they posed the question this way, the average answer was 844 feet. That would be one hell of a tall tree. And then when they asked it in the same question, this way, is the height of the tallest redwood tree more or less than 180 feet? This was the average answer. So you can see how the question was posed has an anchoring effect here, right? So the 1,200 suggests to people that it's somewhere above or below 1,200. But if you suggest it's more or less than 180 feet, it anchors your thinking and your confidence interval around the height of the redwood tree uh, much lower. So it's a third, right? Now, I had originally put this, the power of irrelevant but plausible information, but I added the but plausible because if you would have said, is the height of the tallest redwood tree more or less than 1,200 kilometers, it would have no impact on your guess. So it has to be kind of plausible. But as you can see... If it's plausible, it makes a difference. And when you're, let's say, giving patients choices about what the likelihood of success might be, or the likelihood of an adverse effect, or the improvement in your quality of life if you do or do not undergo a test or procedure or something, you can see how this can come into play, what the information is and how you can structure, structure it. So that's from Kahneman's book. <laughs> This one I found uh, fascinating, and again, if you need any further convincing about the limits to our rationality, here's this one. So they ask students, say you want to get a 
subscription to The Economist magazine. And so they offered these two options. You get 59 bucks for web only. Or you can get the print plus the web for 125 bucks. So in this one, 68% chose the web only. And 32% chose the print plus the web. Um, makes sort of sense. So then they uh, repackaged uh, the choices by adding one. So you notice the middle one is a different option, and it is literally absurd. <laughs> so you would think, well, let's ignore that one and then vote the same way, right? Apparently not. <laughs> so think of what this did, right? It made you think this was a better deal because of this. And people were obviously thinking more of this plus this, rather, uh, this versus this, the, the 125 versus the two plus, the third option versus the second option instead of the first, instead of the third option versus the first option. Now, since this is pretty simple and there are only three choices and the middle one is obviously <laughs> absurd, why would this have such an enormous effect? That's the fascinating part of all of this, that we think we're thinking through things, but we tend to make decisions quickly, and we tend to be distracted easily from the clear logic of our own utility maximizing, to use economic terms. So this is an astonishing finding. And again, if you're still inclined to think that we are utility maximizers and rational calculators, information like this should give you pause. So this is Thaler. How do humans differ from econs? And he says the econs are these guys, and I added this in, are complete jerks. I think that was... Un <laughs> I, I didn't add that, he did. And then as he says, you know, so the, the econ view, uh, humans in, are, would say, are dumber, weaker, willed, and nicer. So that's his... That's a Nobel Prize winner's expert formulation of what the difference is. <laughs> between these two theories. So there's hope for us to get a Nobel Prize. <laughs> so there are, if you look at the literature, there are well over 100 cognitive biases, and I'm just going to go over a few of them, uh, and again, we'll tie them later in into what uh, the implications are for health. So one is, I've already mentioned, loss aversion. That the pain from a loss is greater than the pleasure from a gain of equal size, and you can imagine uh, what this might suggest for certain strategies of improving health care, which I'll go into later. The endowment effect. Uh, we demand more to give up an object than we would pay to acquire it. They've done a lot of experiments where they say, look, uh, uh, here's a coffee cup. Um, you paid $2 for it. What would you sell it for? And uh, they will say $3. Makes no sense whatsoever. But this is, once we have something, it becomes somehow part of our psychological makeup and we grow an attachment to it that we value, even though as a strict economic uh, calculation or transaction, it is literally uh, unintelligible. We have this one, which I think, again, will take not much of a stretch in your thinking to apply to healthcare. We have a tendency to look for information that supports our preconceptions. So... If you want to find that doing X or not doing X is a good thing, it's easy to find literature, studies, anecdotes, tales from your peers that would uh, allow you to persist in that. And moreover, you can filter out the other information that might challenge your preconceptions. And as we saw with the Economist subscription example, there's a framing effect. You can draw different conclusions from the same information or the same outcome scenarios if they are presented differently. So you can actually change people's choices simply by presenting identical information in a different way. We also have a lot of optimism bias. This is a, this is a study of students and ask them, where do you think you're going to finish in the class? And 90% predict they will score in the top 2%. Now, at least 88% or given this reasoning ability, probably closer to 90% are wrong. Um, but it's amazing, right? I mean, again, these are students. They know that they're in a class. They know that only two of them, uh, say there's 100, only two of them are going to be in the top 2%, but it's going to be me. 
which is so unusual. I mean, you think, you know, unless they're total strangers to each other, people kind of know who the smartest kids in the class are and whether they're one of them, but apparently no. <laughs> now, this bodes well for the future of the world that we are relentless optimists, but it could also get us into some trouble if, for example, we say... 90% of people think that their patient's surgical outcomes will be in the top 2%. You know, that has a different meaning. Okay, if this is so, should we just give up the ship and say we're a mess of a species? We are thoroughly unevolved. We are, it's amazing we can get through the day. And we are essentially doomed to irrationality. And I think the good news is no. And we shouldn't draw too much from this. Uh, just because we are not the standard economic person or economic homo econo economicus, if, as the economists would say, it doesn't mean that we're completely irrational. I mean, the world does kind of work. Uh, it's, it functions. It's actually many good things in it. Much makes sense. After all, we have, a, we have a transit system in Vancouver with trains that don't have drivers. That's pretty amazing. So there's lots of good things. Uh, that are quite rational. So I think we should think about it this way. Um, what we mean by rationality uh, maybe needs to be broadened. We need to broaden the definition. It is certainly a lesson to draw from this that if we are aware of our biases, we can be less ruled by them. An example being, uh, the bias I didn't mention was there's a sunk cost bias. Uh, we, we tend to hold on to or keep doing things that we have invested a lot in. And this explains why investors, for example, always sell stocks too late, the, the amateur investor. Pick me. Because you think, well, there's so much in it, maybe it'll come back, and we ignore all the signs that this thing is a dead loser destined for a tax deduction at best. So we hang on. But you know, now that I know that, I think I actually changed my behavior. I guess I should know if I changed my behavior, but I'm so convinced by this literature that I have no idea what I'm doing ever. <laughs> but seriously, we can, we can overcome our biases if we acknowledge that they exist and if we aspire to rationality. And I should say right now, we shouldn't celebrate the findings of behavioral economics as if, aha, you see, we're entitled to behave erratically and to make no sense. It's just to identify that it's a risk factor wired into the human brain, that we can be way less rational than we wish we were. So our aspiration should be to overcome a lot of these biases, not to concede to them. And finally, I think most importantly for policy and practice, we can indeed design choices to make it easier to be as rational as we would like to be. We will never be perfectly rational, even by our own standards. We are unlikely to meet all of our aspirations, but we can do a lot better. And enter the strategy. Uh, how many of you have read or heard of the book Nudge? Lots, right. Well, Nudge, Nudge is a good read. And again, Nudge theory is pretty simple. It's an approach to changing behavior that is less coercive, authoritarian, and rigid. It preserves choice. That's why it's a nudge. It's not a kick. It's not a push. And its creators, Thaler and the uh, legal scholar Cass Sunstein, um, as libertarian paternalism. Libertarian because it preserves your freedom of choice and paternalistic because its aim, at least in the public policy field, is to get, the, get people to do things better, get people to behave better. So it's kind of a, we know what's good for you because we assume that's who you would want to be and therefore we're going to nudge you through all of these techniques into doing better, but we're going to let you choose to be better. At the end of the day, it's up to you. So here's the basic premise that people will make desirable choices, and I put these in quotes because desirable to whom? But let's, so there is a lot of good discussion to be had about whether or not the choice you want people to make is in fact desirable and in fact re reflects uh, what they ought to do. But they will make these choices if you make it easier to make those choices, which is called choice architecture. A simple example, if you want people to eat more salad, and less uh, uh, unhealthy foods in the cafeteria, just put the salads at eye level. If you want people to buy more produce in a grocery store, this is an actual experimental result, 
label half of the, if, when they labeled half of the shopping carts produce bin, they bought way more produce than the ones that weren't so labeled. That's all they had to do. I know, it's funny. It is funny. It's remarkable, though. I mean, how many experiments have that effect size? It was almost double. Like, what could you do? You could design a $20 million intervention in healthcare and got, get an effect size of five percentage points. These guys put a sign up. And if it's done well, <laughs> and this is the critical part, people will make the choices they want to make but don't. In other words, a good and ethical nudge sort of manipulates us into doing what we would, on reflection, agree that we ought to do. So it makes us realize our aspirations to be better selves. That's what a great nudge does. So it has these six principles, uh, and I won't go uh, read them to you, um, but the basic, the basic uh, idea here is that there are several dimensions to nudge, and there are several techniques that you can use, and there are several ways to interpret this, but it's basically not all that complicated. It's genius when it's done right, but it's not complicated. It's like a brilliant ad campaign that works. Uh, it doesn't have to be long, complex, even expensive, but it has to resonate, it has to appeal. So here's one, and one could argue whether this is a good or a bad nudge. So here's a, a European railroad. Uh, it used to be that you bought a ticket, and if you paid an extra one or two euros, you'd get, a, you'd get to designate your seat or choose your seat. Um, when they switched the default, which said that one or two euros is built into the price, but you can opt out, huge increase. So five times as many people, simply because it would have taken unchecking a box or checking a box to not do the seat reservation, not a big burden, not a big behavioral requirement, not a lot of energy, not a lot of time, but just saying you're paying the two euros unless you do a very little thing not to pay the two euros. Five times as many did, and the, and the railway got 40 million bucks more a year. Just by that simple default change. So here's two other examples. Um, uh, tax compliance was a problem in uh, Minnesota. I'm not sure if these were municipal or state taxes. but So they gave, uh, did an experiment where they gave the groups of people four different stories. Um, your taxes will go to fund good things like education. You will be jailed if you don't pay your taxes. We will help you to file your tax return if you are not sure how. And more than 90% of your state citizens already paid their taxes. Number four had by far the biggest effect. People like to conform. People do not like to be outliers, especially in a civic sense. And this energy saving one is really cool from California. So the, it's like audit and feedback for clinical practice. So it says if you tell consumers how much energy they consume against the average for their neighborhood, um, above average users actually decrease significantly, but the unintended consequences in the first round was below average users increase their, their, their uh, uh, energy use significantly. If you think that's far-fetched, uh, in Saskatchewan, this was in the 90s, uh, we reported to the Regina and Saskatoon ophthalmologists that the Saskatoon ophth uh, cataract rate was about 30 or 40 percent higher than the Regina rate. And the outcome was that the Regina rate increased. Again, an unintended consequences. But so what did they do to correct this? They added a, an emoji that it was good, you know, uh, that decreasing was good, and there was, uh, rather than increasing is good. And all they had to do was to say, if you put a smiley face beside the using less energy, the people who were otherwise inclined to increase their energy consumption because they were below average didn't anymore. It wasn't all of them, of course, but it had a pretty big effect size. Again, that corrected the negative impact. Simple thing, add an emoji. Who would have believed it? Now, some strategies are successful and some are less so. So, for example, uh, what do you think? We'll, 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 do a, we'll do this by a show, a show of hands. So, in these ones, um, uh, 
If you want physicians to order fewer head CT scans in the ER, what do you think, having seen this uh, presentation to date and having read, a lot of you have, so who thinks of those three choices, um, what do you think is the best strategy? Who thinks it's A, give those who comply a $1,000 check at the year end? Anyone think that's the best strategy to do this? Who thinks it's B, give them a 1000 bucks immediately and take it back if they don't comply? Hands up high, please. And who thinks it's C? Well, I think you're right. C, B, and A would be the, the order. Some would argue um, it could be B if B was big enough. So the loss aversion of a big loss. But we're talking physicians here, so a thousand bucks is probably not going to do the trick. <laughs> so what does this mean for the field that we're in, healthcare? Well, one is that there's no such thing as neutral choice architecture. So when you're giving either a group of clinicians or patients or even managers choices, you are framing those choices. How you construct the options, what is the comparison pool, how you present the information, it really matters. They have a context and a frame, and you can design those things to influence the direction of the choice. So if you want a women in a low-risk pool to undergo mammography screening, uh, there are many ways to present the information uh, that would either encourage them to do it or discourage them from doing it. Same with, with outcomes like knee arthroscopy, which the literature suggests is often uh, unsuccessful. But again, it's how you present the information and the choices. You can nudge people in one direction or another. Moreover, individual cognitive attributes matter. Uh, we are not homogeneously uh, endowed with the same cognitive biases to the same extent. Some people are truly more rational calculators than others. So how people think influences how they think and what we think as well. Because if you're a provider, how you think, what your cognitive architecture looks like is going to influence not only what you think I should do, but how to present the choices of what I should do. And it will also influence me, therefore. And the corollary is it's useful to understand how people think if you want them to change their behavior or change their frame. Well, this strikes me, if it's all true or plausible, it has a lot of implications for how healthcare providers work. Uh, we all know that change is hard. Status quo bias is one of the hardest things to overcome. So we all are anchored in a present and in a constellation of ways of doing things and in a culture and changing that is really hard, even if we think we want to change. Often our frames are really narrow. We don't consider the broader impact of what we do. We don't, in, we don't even think about what the unintended consequences might, might be, and we often don't consider the impact on other desirable goods or the opportunity costs of what we want to accomplish. And we can give probabilistic accounts that are very rational, we can do very rigorous cost-effectiveness analysis and talk about efficiency and value, but these may actually conflict with how patients and providers actually think and actually respond. It may not only conflict because of their biases and what, they, what their biases lead them to value, such as their notion of risk and whether they're good risk calculators, but it actually might also conflict with their, what they consider to be efficient. And again, acknowledging the reality of these biases is the first step towards overcoming them. And if you want to overcome them, um, you need to get at the assumptions that underlie the behaviors that we have. Instead of assuming, well, Joe's decision-making is terrible because Joe is intransigent and Joe isn't thinking clearly, Getting at why Joe has a different concept of risk assessment or cost benefit. Call is... yellow, all clear. Call yellow, all clear. Call yellow, all clear. It's all clear. <laughs> so um, it's really important. And I think, I think one of the keys here is that since we all, to varying degrees, display these cognitive biases, um, it's really important to respect people and what they think is the right thing to do and to try genuinely to understand their reasoning process before rushing to judgment 
about what's afoot. So how would you put it to work in healthcare? Well, it has been put to work in healthcare in several places. This is a very effective one. You notice one of those strategies was defaults. In other words, this is what happens unless you choose to depart. That's a very good strategy. So if you want people to, uh, if you want a jurisdiction to increase its organ donation rate, the default is that you're going to donate your organs and you have to check off a box saying that you're not. Again, very low barrier, complete freedom of choice, big impact. So this has been used for tests. So in my province, this was years ago, before we even knew what nudge theory was, but actually this was first done in Manitoba, there was a, a requisition, a lab requisition called for something, a SMAC 20, 20 tests done at a time. This was in the 80s, I believe. And you could just order them all with one tech, tick box. So they took off the generic uh, omnibus tick box and said you had to order your individual tests, dramatically reduced the number of tests ordered. And moreover, increase the quality of the reasoning process because people had to think a little bit. Why would I order that test? And of course, the clinical benefit was you do 20 lab tests on someone, you can be, you can be damn sure one of them is going to be abnormal, even if it isn't. So you have an interpretation signal-to-noise problem when you thoughtlessly ignore too, uh, order too much. So this was actually good clinically and good financially. Showing providers the cost of different options is proven to be pretty effective. It's not a massive effect size in the literature, but it is effective. People actually pay attention. Uh, so if you're going to use a generic uh, blood thinner versus a brand name blood thinner and the cost differential is 200 fold, it will make many clinicians think twice about ordering the more expensive one. You can through the uh, acknowledging the propensity of people not to want to be outliers, legitimize unconventional but sound choices. I don't think you should lie about this, but if it's true and, you, and there's a controversial local uh, initiative that says, you know, maybe we shouldn't do this. We shouldn't order the CT scans in such and such a circumstance. If you say doctors at the Mayo Clinic or the Cleveland Clinic or some other place that they admire uh, don't do it, it's the same as the 90% of your neighbors are paying their taxes on time. It actually has an effect. And again, in a more, I think, thoughtful sense, uh, one thing we, this should, nudge theory and behavioral economics should encourage us to do is ask people why they make certain choices that we think, and maybe even they would think are suboptimal, to inform the choice architecture you design. So it makes a difference to understand why they, either their, their clinical behavior doesn't seem to conform with the care pathway of choice or the evidence in general. Instead of dismissing them as just hostile to evidence and uh, poor clinical decision makers, find out what's going on. Maybe it is. Uh, 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 a trigger from a risk assessment because there's the availability heuristic that really comes into play here, which is that certain information sticks in your mind much more than other information and it dominates it even if it's a rare event. So it leads us to overestimate the probability, for example, of an adverse event or a positive event. So there's a lot of either both optimism and und undue optimism and undue pessimism. And if you find out what it is, you may be able to design a choice architecture for those people that actually makes it easier for them to overcome their biases. And I think this is worth a lot of discussion, but if you have to use financial incentives, the literature is pretty clear. Penalties are more effective than bonuses. The experience is pretty clear. We pay more bonuses than penalties. Personally, I'm not a big fan of either, uh, in the sense that if it is really true that people either improve their practice or don't improve it because they're responding to financial incentives, I'm having a tough time trusting that whole enterprise. I think intrinsic motivation is much more important. We found on the paper performance literature that it rarely works as intended, and it rarely solves difficult problems. <clears throat> it sometimes solves easy problems that shouldn't take money. In Ontario, they pay doctors to do pap tests at the proper interval. Well, I'm not a doctor, but if I had to fake one for a day, I, that, oh, 
should do a pap test every three years. I mean, there's some things everybody knows that aren't that difficult. So you end up paying for things that are simple to do, easily countable, rather than what I would want to pay for performance, and that is can you keep a mildly cognitively impaired elderly person with three chronic diseases out of a nursing home for one more year? That's heroic work. No one knows how to pay for that. No one knows how to incentivize that. So I think this is, this is a strategy, the financial incentives, that I'm afraid are not going to account for a whole lot of the variance and account for a whole lot of the improvement. I think the culture of what you do, notions of collective accountability for performance, reducing variations in practice, and appealing to people's desire to do good are far more powerful than financial incentives. But again, that's the old argument about whether standard economics or behavioral <coughs> economics works. Another key finding is that people don't respond identically to identical evidence and frames, so we are not all the same. You know, the, uh, how many of you know about Rogers' diffusion of innovation theory? Well, as you know, the theory says you get the early adopters and then eventually everyone follows along. But it seems to be the case in medicine and in health that <laughs> it stops at the early adopters a lot of the time, that there are no late adopters. So that's a huge problem. I think we need to modify the theory a little bit. And there's a reason why early adopters don't think like later adopters, right? They have these characteristics, by and large. So if you want to change behaviors, you have to understand the people whose behavior you want to change, and that they're different from the people whose behavior has already changed in the desirable direction. It seems pretty simple conceptually, but very few of our strategies differentiate these two groups. I mean, sometimes they do, but it's more about, well, we're going to send you to boot camp or we're going to do a remediation because you're no good. But that's not it. That's, that's, I think the, the, the key is really to understand what makes them late adopters or non-adopters and then tailor strategies to what, what they want to do. So here's my uh, emerging and probably unpersuasive even to me theory and analogy. So we've got... You know, we're in the era, beginning of the era of personalized medicine, right? We're going to have these drugs and therapies based on our unique genetic signatures and makeup. And that's going to make medicine way more precise and way more effective with way fewer failures, way fewer adverse consequences. And it's going to be, if it ever works out this way, it's going to be a glorious new uh, bones type uh, wave a wand and the world will be better. And you know what? I, I'm sort of making... This is potentially magical stuff, and it's based on being able to be precise at the individual level, which is an enormous, enormous conceptual and increasingly a little bit, at least, empirical advance in medicine. Well, my theory is that our cognitive signatures are in many ways just as unique as our genetics, and, of course, our cognitive characteristics are somewhat determined by our genetics. So if that's the case... Uh, I think we have, just like we have social determinants of health, we have social determinants of cognition, that is how we think, our own biases and their weight in our collective composite psychic makeup, they will be different too, and they will be mediated by our environment, sociologically, professionally, uh, with the hierarchy of the reward systems in the organizations we work, etc. So we are all responding to different cues environmentally and culturally, as well as having certain dispositions individually based on genes and other factors. Well, if that's the case, is it really a good analogy then that if therapeutics will eventually match our genetic signatures, do we need behavior change strategies to match our cognitive signatures? And I'm going to suggest very provisionally further research is needed. <laughs> but I, I think this may be true, actually. And it's just like, and I don't think it's far-fetched because... We say this in other ways. We say, if you want to motivate Sally, you have to take a different approach to motivating Sally than Joanne and Bill. Well, if that's true, in general, in an organizational setting, or to improve behavior, or to meet their needs, why isn't it true in terms of getting a more evidence-informed approach to clinical care, for example? I think it is true, or at least it's plausibly true, and I think if we begin from this assumption, or we take this assumption as possibly true, it will change dramatically how we go about trying to improve care and practice. 
So in other words, and put it another way, maybe we need personalized KT as opposed to generic KT. And once we figure out how the two match up, the cognition, et cetera, with the strategies for change, we will perhaps do quite a bit better. I want to conclude with some critiques of Nudge because they're real. Um, one is that it's manipulative. It is used to get me to do what you want me to do. And I think the answer is, yeah, it's true. Um, hopefully, it's what I want to do, too. But all advertising, social marketing, persuasion, the, the whole world is made up of people trying to persuade other people to do things and agree to them. So I think this is true, but it's not fatal to the enterprise, and it's not even, there's nothing that's even necessarily wrong with it. We are not all the same and we won't respond to the same cues. It's absolutely true. We're not, it's not a theory of everything, and it certainly won't explain all or even most human behavior, but it will explain quite a bit. And it can be used to support bad choices. Absolutely true. So, indeed, when you get a drug company claiming that there's a 30% reduction in risk and we're now telling us that the absolute risk was very low to begin with, that's a nudge, that's a framing effect, that is designed to make us conclude certain things that our better selves would not want to go. So you can use this. And, of course, any technique, understanding, approach to change can be used for multiple purposes, not all of them noble. So you do have to. And in fact, Sunstein, Thaler's partner, has written a very good and readable book on the ethics of nudge. Uh, that I would recommend to you if you're interested in it. It goes over some of these challenges uh, very well. So, finally, what can behavioral economics do for us? I think we can do all of these things. And I, I think the most important thing is it makes us a little more humble about the enterprise we're in and our role in it and how smart we are and how rational we are. I do think it can make us more em empathetic because instead of assuming that people are wrong-headed, unable to understand, simply not getting it, there are reasoning processes at work here. They may not be as rational as we would like, but there is a reason for the irrationality, and we need to address it and respect the people. It, it can help us break free. Just acknowledging it again, I think it's the most important thing. Just acknowledging that we have these biases may help us be less hostage to them, and it can actually turn our creativity loose, because if we have to factor these biases into the equation of how we want to get things done, instead of saying, read three systematic reviews, come back tomorrow and change your life, we will have to come up with some more creative strategies around this to figure out what's going on and to map onto it. So at the end, it can actually make the world more evidence-informed than it is now, because I think it searches for strategies to give the evidence a more prominent role by confronting the barriers to giving the strategies, uh, the evidence a more prominent role. And I think from the patient and citizen point of view, once we realize that we and our providers are all endowed with the same potential biases and their meanings, and we understand each other better, I think it can actually make that vaunted, called for partnership and co-decision making by patients and their providers a little more possible because we're all in this cognitive mess together and we can find our way out of it together. So thank you for your attention. Be happy to get to